In this video, I'm going to teach you what occurs when we do radical substitution reactions with substances that contain benzylic or allylic hydrogens. First of all, I need to remind you what a benzylic or allylic hydrogen is. A benzylic hydrogen is a hydrogen that is attached to a carbon that is one position away from a benzene ring. If I remove that hydrogen radically, I end up forming a benzyl radical, that is, a radical at this position. I've invented a song that can help you remember that the benzyl position is one carbon away from a benzene ring. It goes like this. Benzyl, 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 benz, one away from his friends. Ooh. Similarly, an allyl hydrogen is a hydrogen that is attached to a carbon that's one carbon away from a carbon-carbon double bond. If I remove that hydrogen radically, it ends up giving me a radical carbon that's once again one position away from a carbon-carbon double bond. I also have a song for remembering that the allyl position is the position that is one carbon away from a carbon-carbon double bond. It goes like this. Allyl, 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 one away from his pals. Ooh. You have to put the ooh at the end of the song or it just doesn't stick. As you can see in this slide, benzyl and allyl radicals are very, very stable and are much more stable even than tertiary radicals, which are, as I mentioned in an earlier video, more stable than secondary radicals, which are more stable than primary radicals, which are more stable than methyl radicals. Vinyl radicals, which are radicals in which I've got a single unpaired electron on one of the two carbons in the carbon-carbon double bond, are also comparably unstable. You might ask, why in the world are allyl and benzyl radicals so stable? The reason is because of resonance. As we've seen with allyl carbocations, allyl radicals can also rearrange by resonance by having this electron go into here and one of these two electrons go into here to form a carbon-carbon double bond while pumping the second of these two electrons up onto this carbon, as shown here. Thus, this radical is resonance stabilized and is in reality balanced and shared between the leftmost carbon and the rightmost carbon. In the case of benzyl radicals, this radical can resonate through four total atoms, the one shown here at the benzyl carbon, the one shown here at this position, the one shown at this position, and at this position. If we continue resonating back, we end up right at the first resonance structure at which we started. Thus, you can see that benzyl and allyl radicals are the most stable radicals in this series. So what implications does that have for real-life chemistry? Well, if I take an alkene like this that has an allyl carbon, and I treat it with X2, either Br2 or Cl2, and heat or light radical conditions, I will end up putting one molecule of the halogen on the allyl position. The mechanism by which that proceeds is exactly as we've discussed before. In the initiation step, this X2 breaks into two individual X radicals. One of those X radicals abstracts a hydrogen off of this molecule. From which position will it abstract that hydrogen? Of course, from the allyl position, because that gives me a carbon radical here, which is resonance stabilized. The second molecule of X radical will then come in and form a bond at that location, giving me this product. An analogous thing occurs when I take a molecule that has a benzyl carbon and treat it with X2 and light or heat, radical conditions. I ultimately abstract a hydrogen from this benzyl carbon and then have a second molecule of X radical come in and form a bond at the benzyl position. This is the major product formed. I'd now like to introduce you to another reagent that's very, very important. It's called NBS. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny name. Anyway, NBS is an abbreviation for n bromosuccinimid It happens to be a mild radical brominating reagent that doesn't add to the alkene at all. Here's how this goes down. This is the structure of NBS. Once again, it's essentially a source of bromine radical. If I take NBS and react it with an alkene of some sort under radical conditions, that is light or heat and peroxide, it will, for all practical purposes, always place a bromine one position away from the double bond, right here. This is, once again, the allyl position. One away from his pals. Ooh. 
that's restated once again in this paragraph. NBS adds a bromine to the carbon that's one position away from the double bond, which is the allylic or benzylic carbon, because that's where the most stable radical is located. This brings us to an excellent lecture problem. What will be the major product or products of the reaction of one methyl cyclohexene with each of the following reagents under these conditions? You're welcome, of course, to pause the video now as I'm going to share the answer with you momentarily. Here's the first. One methyl cyclohexene being treated with NBS heat and peroxide. These are radical conditions. Here's the overall reaction. As I stated before, if you take NBS, heat and peroxide, and treat an alkene with it, it will always place a bromine one carbon away from the double bond. You should notice that there are three different carbons in this molecule that are one carbon away from the double bond. Thus, this reaction gives rise to three different products. A bromine at this position, which is one away from the double bond, a bromine at this position, which is also one away from the double bond, and a bromine at this position, which is one away from the double bond. The major product or products of all of these is likely to be these two in some relatively close ratio because both of them involve secondary radicals, which are more stable than the primary radical that would give rise to this product here. Let's take a look at our second conditions. Treating one methyl cyclohexene with Br2 by itself in dichloromethane. Now this is a reaction you've seen before from an earlier chapter. As we've seen earlier, the double bond comes out here and forms a bond with a bromine, giving rise to a three-membered ring with a bromine at the point. The second molecule of bromide comes in and attacks from the backside, ultimately giving rise to this product in a racemic mixture. This product is interesting because each of these positions is both a stereocenter, so in reality there are four different potential stereoisomers that you could get and will get in complete 50-50 mixtures. What if I take one methylcyclohexene and just treat it with HBr by itself under non-radical conditions? Well, you've seen this reaction so many times that you're probably sick of it. I have this starting material. Electrons come out and form a bond with the hydrogen, kicking off the bromide. The hydrogen, of course, positions itself here because it gives me the more stable carbocation intermediate. And then the Br- comes in and forms a bond at that position, giving me this product here. You'll note that this carbon center is not a stereocenter because it's not bonded to four different things. The branches up top and here to the left are identical all the way around. In fact, this molecule itself is meso because I can draw a line right down the middle of it and see that both the upper side of it and the lower side of it are mirror images of each other. What if I treat one methylcyclohexene with HBr under radical conditions? Well, as I pointed out before, if you do this reaction, it ends up putting the bromine at the anti-Markovnikov position in this double bond by a mechanism that I've already shown you. You're welcome to review it if you wish. Thus, this would give rise to this product. You'll note that this product has two stereocenters. Thus, I can potentially obtain two different sets of diastereomers, each having two enantiomers apiece. I will, in theory, get all four of those molecules in complete 50-50 mixtures. I now want to finish this lecture by just sharing with you a couple of examples in which radical reactions actually occur in real-life living systems. There's a whole family of enzymes that we humans, as well as many other eukaryotes have, that are called cytochrome enzymes. These enzymes are primarily responsible for helping our bodies metabolize nonpolar molecules. For instance, if you get a nonpolar molecule into your body somehow, such as an alkane, like octane, which you would get if you breathed in gasoline fumes when you're filling up your car, how does your body get rid of that? The solvent that's present as a major constituent in our body is water, which is very polar. So if I get a nonpolar molecule in my body, how in the world is it going to be able to be excreted? It can't be excreted in urine or feces under traditional circumstances because it doesn't dissolve in polar media. The answer is these cytochrome enzymes convert nonpolar molecules into polar molecules by putting oxygens all over them. Here's how that reaction proceeds. The active site of the cytochrome enzymes is an iron-5 atom 
that is double bonded to an oxygen in its relaxed state. It undergoes a radical mechanism to convert to this product and form carbon radical. Carbon radical then abstracts this hydroxyl group radically to convert this active site to iron 3, and now this carbon has an OH on it. You'll notice that an OH is way more polar than a carbon hydrogen bond. This is how cytochrome is able to take nonpolar molecules that don't dissolve in water in our bodies and convert them one step at a time into polar molecules that are water soluble and can be excreted from our systems by once again radically placing OHs all over the molecule as many as are needed until that molecule becomes polar enough to dissolve in water and then be excreted through urine or feces. Here's a specific example, the conversion of nicotine an infamous molecule with which I'm sure you're familiar to a polar metabolite. Here's nicotine itself. You can see that its structure is not extremely polar. It does have an NH bond which is slightly polar, but it's nonpolar enough that when it goes into my body, my body would have a difficult time dissolving it and allowing me to excrete it. So what occurs when nicotine is ingested or inhaled in some way is it encounters one of these cytochrome enzymes. Through a radical mechanism, the cytochrome enzyme abstracts a hydrogen at this position to form a carbon radical here, and then it radically donates an OH to this position to form a hydroxyl group here. At this point, this molecule can then be further oxidized by the cytochrome enzymes to form this molecule cottonine, which is water soluble enough that it can be excreted in the urine. Now as mentioned, all of these cytochrome enzymes involve the element iron in their active sites. So yes, we do need to make sure that we consume iron. Here's a computer model of the heme cofactor, that is the iron active site inside the cytochrome enzymes. The iron atom is this gold atom in the center, which is flanked by four nitrogen atoms in this type of structure called a protoporphyrin. This is what the active site in the cytochrome enzymes looks like. As we saw in our earlier example, our iron 2 atom gets oxidized up to iron 5 oxide before it can act as a hydroxylating agent for polarizing nonpolar molecules that we've ingested or inhaled. Now, as I mentioned before, cytochrome enzymes' primary responsibility is to hydroxylate and oxidize nonpolar substances that have invaded our systems to make them more polar so that they can be excreted through the urine or the feces. The beautiful thing about cytochrome enzymes is that they have the ability to do this to nearly any nonpolar molecule imaginable without any particular type of discrimination. One of my old biochemistry professors used to call the cytochrome enzymes the promiscuous enzymes. Let me show you one more example of cytochrome metabolism. So this is a molecule called seldane antihistamine. This would be the, a medicine that we would take as an antihistamine for controlling allergic reactions. As it turns out, this molecule is cardiotoxic, that is harmful for our cardiovascular health, unless it's metabolized. Unfortunately, despite the fact it has these two hydroxy groups here, it is still as a whole nonpolar enough that it can't be excreted in the urine with relative ease. So how in the world does our body metabolize it? By using the cytochrome enzymes. So how in the world is this molecule metabolized for further use or excretion? Well, what occurs is one of the methyls on this tert butyl group out here gets oxidized through action of our cytochrome enzymes up to form a primary alcohol. Once this has been oxidized to a primary alcohol state, it then gets oxidized further to form an aldehyde and then a carboxylic acid, ultimately giving rise to this molecule known as Allegra. Now the specific site of oxidation of this molecule seldane antihistamine is more based on accessibility than radical stability. You might notice that there are numerous other positions that could generate a more stable radical en route to putting an OH on a position. However, apparently this molecule fits into the cytochrome enzyme's active site in such a way that the enzyme targets one of these terminal methyl groups rather than one of the more stable internal carbons. So that's going to be the place where we end today's lecture. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. Please stay tuned for my next and final lecture in which we'll finish our discussion on Chapter 12's coverage of radical chemistry by showing how it can be used in total synthesis. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.